Jim Wolfenson is among the most outspoken voices on the risks of poverty. He was president of the World Bank from 1995 through 2005. Now he advises global leaders as chairman of Wolfenson & Company. Jim Wolfenson is here on the inside track. Jim, not long ago, in fact, just a few weeks ago, before the uprising in Egypt, you said unless one deals with the question of the poorest people in the world, the world will not be safe. Is this what you had in mind? Well, it's exactly what I had in mind. I think that the reason that you get uprisings is not uh, because of people that ferment it, uh, just because they're trying to create a problem. It's because there's dissatisfaction. And throughout the Middle East, and indeed throughout many countries in the world, that dissatisfaction is caused by people that just have no money and uh, cannot eat. And so they get mad. And it's not uh, it's a very human reaction and one that should be anticipated. So, Mohammed el Baradai yes. obviously is trying to play his political cards right, but he says that right now Egypt is a powder keg ready to explode. Is he right? My own judgment would be that that is correct. Uh, and uh, I think that what we've seen in the last days is the first example of the people actually expressing themselves and demonstrating that they have power. What is happening at this very minute is a test of that power, a test of the power of people against the power of the military. But by the same token, is Bob Zellick similarly right that this is merely just the beginning? Whatever, the trans whatever shape the transition to democracy takes, uh, the new government is going to face tremendous challenges. My own judgment is exactly the same, and I think it's not just in Egypt. With the creation of, of networks like yours and with Internet, what happens now in one country immediately gets transmitted in terms of ideas to other countries, so that if something happens in Egypt, I think you can expect infection throughout the Middle East. Okay, well, let's talk about that for a moment. How vulnerable is the rest of the Middle East to the kinds of anarchy, potentially, that we are beginning to see glimpses of in Egypt. Well, what I thought was interesting that was in the first days, you heard uh, reactions from the leaders of many of the other countries saying, we will change. Uh, we're not going to get in this situation. We're doing something for the poor. We're going to make freedom a greater facility for the people. And so there is no doubt that leadership throughout the Middle East understands that this is a real potential infection for them. But surely Hosni Mubarak understood this as well. Okay, they've, he's taken some steps. The Egyptians find them uh, unsatisfactory. We've seen similar political steps taken in Jordan and in Yemen. But ultimately, are you concerned that that's just lip service, that the autocratic approach to rule in the Middle East will continue and that the poor will, refrain, re will remain repressed enough that the situation continues? Well, the autocrats have had it pretty good. You know, they've had most of the income. They've uh, gotten very rich. And the reason that they've been able to do that is because of their dependence on the military or on secret police. And what is being tested by these uh, manifestations in Egypt is whether millions of people can in fact change the mind of those at the top who are trying to keep the rest of the people down using military and other force and in Egypt we'd hope that that might change yesterday and the day before but the military have now come out and said go back home we'll arrange the change. What are the hottest spots in your mind in the Middle East right now? Where is this most likely to flare? Well, I think Egypt is, is clearly one such place. The Jordanians must be very worried because uh, the king in Jordan has some support from tribal leaders, but the majority of people in Jordan are in fact now Palestinian. So you have a real problem in Palestine, and it would not surprise me if in other parts of the region you would find significant changes that are in the offing. What is it going to mean to the Middle East, to the world, if the situation in Egypt turns violent, as many people expect it will, possibly even today? Well, I think the thing that most people are worried about is Suez Canal and the flow of oil, because, as you well know, the price of oil and the facility to get oil is very dependent on the Suez. Now, in the last days, there's been very little problem. There have been a few slowdowns, but that's all. I think the big issue is energy, and in particular, oil from the Middle East. And if you have a conflagration in the Middle East, then the rest of us get in real trouble. You know, Laura, you just, we just heard from Laura. We saw what's going on behind her. You can hear the noise of the crowd in your ears. You know, we all know by now, that this is a popular uprising with few precedents uh, in the modern world. 
financial markets, however, seem to be discounting all of this. Are they wrong? Well, I think the financial markets are saying the military will win, that you'll get back to stability in the country. And uh, they're backing, I think, the fact that the stability will come as a result of military intervention. Uh, that's not to say that that's what they'd like, but the markets are always happier when there is stability. What they don't know is what would happen if the public took over, and then you have the issues of how quickly could you get a new president in place. It's a 60-day constitutional arrangement that they have to put someone in. No one for 30 years has been thinking about challenging President Mubarak. So there is a lot to be done and a lot of uncertainty. And so I think the markets are stable because they prefer certainty. Is that to say, though, that they're betting on violence? And if they are, because some would say that's the only way to contain this crowd, do you believe it can even be contained at this point? Well, I think quite clearly the military have spoken to the people in the in the streets and told them don't come to the national buildings because if you do we'll shoot you and we have no choice but to shoot you we must protect the institutions and so it's clear from the leaders in the streets that they're not going to take them on at this moment the real question for everybody is will the uh, Will the manifestations that of the streets continue and will the military back down? Is there some sort of secret deal with Mubarak that he'll jump on a plane at some point? Jim, when you think about the situation and its implications for the rest of the developing world, what in your mind is the worst case scenario? I think the worst case scenario would be that Mubarak stays and nothing changes, uh, not in 90 days and not when he gets uh, hands over to somebody to get re-election uh, or to get an election, assuming that he will then leave. The worst case is, I think, that this uncertainty has been in the developing world for years, this issue of poverty, the fact that there are always a group of people at the top that are very rich and they don't give it down. This is a test of that situation. And if you don't have the poor people get a better life, you're going to have long-term serious problems. Well, briefly, is the rest of the world listening? This is a subject that you talk to people about. Are they paying attention? Are they going to change? In my judgment, uh, people agree with you in terms of the issue. What they don't agree with you on is how it can be resolved. And indeed, what you're seeing at this very minute in the streets is a test of resolution of people's will against an authoritarian regime. And it's very important what happens. It certainly is. Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Thank a you. test of will in Egypt. You heard it from Jim Wolfenson, chairman and founder of Wolfenson & Company, former head of the World Bank.